Uh, let's move on to our next story here. Uh, the data out this morning, the number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits rising unexpectedly last week. 742,000 workers filed for those initial jobless claims, signaling a slowdown in the economic recovery. With a federal program, we're talking about expanding and enhancing those benefits set to expire at the end of the year. Our next guest says workers could be headed for a hundred. $50 billion shortfall in reduced income. Let's bring in Brett Ryan. He is a senior U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank. And Brett, the number we got out this morning seems to sort of uh, confirm the, the concerns that have been emerging over the last several months, which is that the momentum in this economic recovery is slowing. Yeah, good morning, Kiko and, and Zach, and thank you for having me. Um, part of the, the increase in initial claims this morning was due to the state of Louisiana, so I don't want to overstate um, the, the weakness in today's initial claims. Uh, but I think the more concerning trend that you're seeing is that the decline in continuing claims at the state level is probably overstating how, uh, how robust the labor, uh, labor market recovery is going, because what you're seeing is an increase every week in pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, which is the extended benefits program. And there are still a significant amount of people, which a little under 9 million on Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, PUA. Um, those two programs, PUA and PEUC, are set to expire on December 31st. So right now, there are about a little bit around 13 million people on PUA and PEUC. You would expect that to drop to somewhere between 10 to 12 million uh, by the end of the year. But for those 10 to 12 million people, their income will go to zero if Congress does not uh, reapprove these programs. That could cost you around $150 billion uh, in the first quarter. It's not going to be offset by uh, job creation and labor income. That's where you can get some weakness in the first quarter. And Brett, I mean, when we talk about that, obviously we've been seeing those numbers uh, grow when we talk about uh, people who have exhausted their uh, unemployment benefits and PEUC, we've seen that grow uh, in the last four weeks by about 1 million claims. So, I mean, uh, there's more people shifting in that direction. We've seen that, but when it comes to the overall number here, I, I guess when you look at the broader implications, a lot of people are debating right now if this was just kind of a fluke number in terms of the overall initial claims, or if this is the beginning of a trend to show weakness is here and here to stay? Yeah, I think that you are going to see a little bit of a pause um, in the near term, especially with the rising case growth that you're seeing. That's, you know, 95% of GDP uh, is in counties with rising case, case growth. You're seeing renewed restrictions um, across the board, especially with the closing of indoor dining. So to give you an idea, uh, food services and accommodations have accounted for about 35% of the employment gain, 4 million jo jobs, over 4 million jobs over the past, uh, since April. Um, with indoor dining being shut down again in many cities, uh, soon to be in New York City, it's already been in, in other states, you're going to see um, definitely uh, a, another wave of layoffs in that space. So it's, un it's unfortunate. Um, but we are going to be dealing with these near-term disruptions to high-contact service industries, especially like the, those that employ a large number of people, like restaurants and bars, um, until we have a vaccine, a widely available vaccine. That's what we're going to be living with. How much worse are things going to get then? I mean, you've already pointed to that $150 billion shortfall in terms of income for workers. Um, you know, you said, look, this is about a 1% off of growth. So this comes at a time when we still don't have any kind of fiscal relief. Um, how much worse do you think things could get? Yeah, so I mean, the the loss of income for those people, I mean, it, number one, from a humanitarian perspective, you know, 10 to 10 10 to 12 million people that are stuck out of work uh, in this environment, to cut them off like that would be would be wrong. Um, the second thing, though, is you don't know what's going to happen. The knock-on effects are going to be via missed rent payments, missed credit card payments, missed student loan payments. And you have rent moratoriums that are expiring at year-end, as well as student loan uh, forgiveness that's expiring at year-end. These are all things that Congress needs to get done now sooner rather than later, and you can't leave it until the next president comes in because then you're going to have a gap over a month. Those knock-on effects, auto loan defaults, credit card defaults, that could send, um, you know, have a, a bit more of a risk-off tone 
that feeds into negative sentiment. And that's, that's I think, the, the broader concern. Yeah, when you talk about negative sentiment, I mean, is the broader concern there that it would finally start to trickle into, uh, you know, consumer spending? I mean, we got the retail sales number that was weaker than expected uh, heading into holiday shopping season. You know, that's going to send some tremors there and, and fears that that might continue. Uh, I mean, when you look at the, the largest chunk of the economy here and the state of the consumer here, how is that held up? And where do you put it here as we prepare to kind of uh, get ready for 2021 when there's hopes that that vaccine is going to be coming through to help those industries you're talking about that are hardest hit. You know, without question, the the consumer has been much stronger than than most have anticipated. The savings rate, nonetheless, still remains high. Um, but the savings is concentrated amongst those that have the lowest marginal propensity to consume. Those that still have jobs and they aren't able to, cons- you know, they're consuming just fine. But what we're seeing now is that the pent-up demand for goods is going to start to, to slow. Uh, vehicle sales you know, have spiked higher. Um, I think they're going to see them slow going forward. Uh, and as that, what you need to see happen in terms of consumer spending is services come back. That has really been the biggest hit to overall consumption has been services, particularly healthcare services, surprisingly. Um, and so what we need is it's going to take more time. Again, it's, it's vaccine that's going to be able to allow a normal, full normalization of services, especially healthcare services, going to the doctor's office, dentist's office, allowing them to return to full capacity, uh, as well as hotels, accommodations, restaurants, and travel, like we talked about previously. And that's still going to be some time away. So in the near term, you're going to see good spending start to revert back to its pre-virus trend because you've had the overshoot from pent up demand from the lockdowns. So that begins to slow a bit. And I think it's really important because we're expecting weakness in the next two quarters uh, for, for consumer spending. I think, you know, significantly below consensus. We see PCE, real PCE growing about 2% mm-hmm. versus consensus of a little bit of closer to 4%. And just for these reasons, um, you know, good spending is set to slow. We have income set to, um, a potential hit to income if Congress doesn't do anything. At the same time, we have rising restrictions on services. So, you know, we're, we're kind of left with a weaker forecast near term. Yeah, an indication of more pain to come, as you point out, until the vaccine does come to market. Uh, Brett Ryan, senior U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank. It's good to talk to you today. Great. Thank you for having me.